and it will tell you whether or not it's present, and in fact, tell you something about it if you find it. So I visited the Analyze back in 2004 at, uh, at CERT up in Pittsburgh. Uh, we built the initial version of it, applied it to, to polymorphic and virtualized code. There are some, there are some articles in the CERT research reports about it. And then in 2009, the project and the entire team, in fact, moved to Oak Ridge, and we changed names because it's important to, uh, to deal with branding. We changed names from FX to Hyperion, and there have been many different applications of it here. One of the things that I would say was the, the primary uh, contribution uh, the technology after it moved was turning it into a product, turning it into something that was reliable, so you could uh, deliver it, it had well-documented, there's training for it, et cetera. Uh, all that was built out at a bridge so that we could have a nice stable base or we could continue search. So here's the basics of how Hyperion works. We take compiled software, we perform uh, disassembly, uh, we handle uh, any disassembly, which we'll talk a little bit about. We then do uh, structured discovery, so we turn the disassembled program into a structured program. We do a total call discovery, so if your program has no import table or the calls are obfuscated in various ways, we use the information we discovered earlier in the process to so construct that and discover what the actual external calls actually are, what the arguments are. And then we do behavior discovery, which is where we actually use uh, these patterns of behavior to recognize and document with that. Right now, we have two platforms up here in target. They target 32 bit uh, Intel, and they target the uh, MSP, the CI MSP 430 embedded processor, just because those are the platforms that customers have access to uh, deal with. So, you deal with engine assembly, if you're not familiar with it, uh, there's an example down. Uh, on the slide here. Do you the example on the on the bottom right? Uh, the first four bytes are a move instruction. Those are followed by an XOR instruction that excludes the board's with itself. The result of doing that is always zero. So that jump zero uh, takes you back. So you count back with E, D, C, D, A, 9, and that takes you back to that uh, jump five instruction, which you see was, a, was part of the original move instruction, but now it's being reinterpreted. You jump forward five, and now you're in the real code. A straight line disassembly, if you just point the disassembly uh, at this, you'll see the move, the XOR, the jump minus seven, but then you'll see a call instruction after that, and you'll be off and will not be the real code. So we have to deal with crazy disassembly, engine assembly techniques, uh, funny things like that. The way that Hyperion deals with this is it allows, uh, it's a, a threaded disassembly. It allows a single address to appear multiple times in the, in the final program. Uh, and when we do that, it's sort of outlined on the slide here. We identify the entry point, we find main, we, we begin adding addresses to the stack and exploring the program. And, and that's almost true. And the reason it's almost true is because we have to do a little bit of, uh, we have to do a little bit of everything to make any of this work. So it's a very iterative process. For example, we find main uh, using a variety of methods, one of which is we look at the complexity of the structured program, the structured islands we discovered. So we typically uh, find that main is the most complex of the structured islands encountered after the entry, and that works very well for us. So there are a number of ways that we can, we can go about uh, doing this, and they all require that you, you do quite a bit of work. But the end result is a, uh, a static disassembly, even when you have the reinterpretation of, of some address. We then do structuring, we turn things into sequences, and then also values, and we do extraction of it. So for sequences, it's structure composition. For something else, is, it's a, it's a Composition. For this, it's a little harder. There are a number of techniques we can use. We can do loop slicing, the, the most that we've done on using uh, relations. We find that loop unrolling, which I didn't have the slide, we find that loop unrolling uh, works quite well. We can often unroll the loop and discover what it's doing uh, pretty readily. Uh, if that doesn't work, we'll back on slicing other techniques. But let's look at this for our program function. So, given a, a barrage of instructions, we boil that down to its net effect. So, what you see there, uh, the result is, in this case, the list of the slides are modified, and what the new value is in terms of the prior value. So, what you don't see in that little list, there's any register. And that's because the net effect of this sequence is to leave all the registers unchanged. Uh, this is a no-op, and I can't recall what piece of malware we got this from, but it came out of a, a piece of malware that sprinkled liberally through it, and the end result was to make the program very, very long and, and difficult to register. I think the discovery of these no op takes them out uh, right away. That takes us to call traces. We have the computer behavior, we've reconstructed the external function calls, and now what we need to do is uh, to transform the result into a call trace. And we do this, I should point out, across function boundaries. So we, we take a function, we generate call traces, we also just across function boundaries, we can recognize behavior that may start in one function and, and proceed across many. We use a turn rewriter to do this transformation. And, uh, and the nice thing about call traces is that this is something that the software engineers think they understand. They, when they see a, a window call, they believe they know what that means, and so they can, they can read it out. And in fact, that's how we go about defining behavior specification. So this is an example of a call trace taken from a pretty output for a piece of malware. And we see a number of things happening here. Open process, open process token, duplicate token, and it resonate logs on user. This is an interesting little sequence. And uh, when we looked up this little sequence of stuff, we found some code on Google Code. This is code used to bypass the device driver signing on Windows. And if we take those two pieces of code and we overlay them, we see they line up very nicely. And that hints at a process. It hints at going back, taking this, turning it into a, a general pattern that so replaces some of the specific stuff in there with some cares or with, uh, or with the uh, uh, the pieces that link it together, so you see the HW in green has to be the same HW token pass to duplicate. You see that uh, uh, in the next one, the HB token has to be the same uh, HB token uh, pass to launch up to first uh, log on user. So we replace those with variables so they, they line up, and then we can identify that pattern wherever it occurs. And in fact, uh, that's what we do. We call those behavior specification units. So that high level language that makes them very easy to write. If you, can, if you can write programs for Windows, you can very easily write these. If you're not quite up to writing programs for Windows, you can still write these because it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, simple language used for writing these patterns. What happens, of course, is these patterns get compiled into nasty, nasty math that you never want to see, and that's okay that happens behind the scenes. So 
So here's a, a snippet of one of our uh, one of our BSUs. This is when we used to recognize any sandboxing techniques. So if you imagine this, you're probably not aware. Uh, we took a lot of these from Penrose Fish, which is what started the modern day. Penrose Fish is an example of various anti uh, sandboxing, AD debugging techniques. And you can see we represent a DSU. So there's a DSU somewhere called Check the Small Disk Size, there's one called Check the Knob Movement, uh, et cetera. And it's in the rules of the bottom code. If you match any of those, uh, under any conditions, uh, we want to apply this any sandbox tag to that piece of code. So uh, we can look for any of this stuff. If Hyperion finds any of this in the call places, it labels it as any sandboxing, and then you can go and look and see what's actually taking place there. And it's easily expanded as we write it in, in fact, this is a snippet of the larger one. As we discover a new kind of any sandboxing, we just add another DSU and a rule to it and easily expand it. Here's our key logger detector. Uh, in full, so some of those DSUs like get keypress, it's what you might imagine, it's all different ways on Windows that you might correct keypress. All that file write complete, and that's all different ways in which you would write to a file. We have uh, a couple of things going on here. One is a keypress, has to be the same in both, so we know that the keypress that was read is the one that's been written. File is part of the file write complete DSU, but we don't care about it here, so we just say it because we don't care. And the rule says that I have to have V1 followed at some point by V2. Things can happen between the two, things can happen, uh, and, and any, any DSU that matches either one of those is fine, and Things can, in fact, happen in different functions in different parts of the code. But the point being, if I find a new way to read a key press on Windows, I just add that to the get key press DSU, and nothing else has to change. If I find a new way to write it, I add that to the far right, and nothing else has to change. If I get interested in people writing key presses to the network, well, then I add a new line that says network write complete, and I be sure that key press is the reference there, and I can add a second rule, which then says V1 followed by V1 to V3, and either one of those would that would exist. So the point is, DSUs are very simple, especially simple and easy to write. It's pretty easy to read. There are a few special symbols in it, but not that much. The dollar signs are variable. I'm just going to care. You can learn that very easily. They're very extended and they're very robust. So here's a, here's a slide example of it. Here's some bytes from an actual piece of malware. This is the malware that was used to attack Oak Ridge National Laboratory back in 2011. Uh, that we captured. We can disassemble it. There's part of disassembly. And for those of you who love reading disassembly, this is, this is great. We can structure it. They so turn this into like, call recognition and then destructuring. And so we see it then also popping up and we see while loops, et cetera. And that could be helpful. But let's turn it into a call uh, sequence because that will surely clear it all up once we see the, uh, the call chain. So there it is, and I'm sure that clears it all up. You can see it's going on open process, virtual allocation, write process, et cetera. A lot of stuff in here. But the Ethereum system uh, does the bookkeeping, boils all this down to the one thing you really care about, which is the fact that the code is doing process injection. So you get a BSU match, uh, it matches across all the bytes, and it says, ah, this piece of code is doing process injection. The first argument, I believe, specifies the process into which you're going to inject. The second one, it specifies the code you're going to inject. And the third is a, is a uh, delay uh, so that you can avoid, hopefully, avoid detection. And we, we get that without actually actually any of it. We match it. We can see which parts of it uh, match that and what's going on. So, again, this is for some of where we are. PLL8, we've delivered this number of organizations. It seems to be working uh, well. We're collaborating with folks at the Applied Physics Lab, at Lawrence Livermore, at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and at Sandia National Laboratory. The term rewriter that is used in the system is open source. So if you go to GitHub, you can go and grab that. We have about 237 behavior specification units, which allow us to, to match a, a very large uh, corpus of malware. We have our own malware corpus here. We work with some external organizations that have their own. And so when we're looking at our coverage of this, uh, we've got right now 237 BSUs, and we're, we're doing really good matching. And that 